farting for one reason and another. Great to see so many kids here. That's absolutely wonderful. I um, didn't expect kids to turn up at church in a pub, but there you are. Everything's always unexpected. Um, and great to see uh, young people and old people. So, uh, young people and uh, middle-aged people. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so what we're going to do is start the prayer. We haven't got any, uh, this thing, this wonderful technology is all shot, so we can't have any uh, music, I'm afraid, so that's out of it. I can't put a PowerPoint up, so you're going to have to listen to me all the time, which is whatever. So, let's just start with a prayer. We've got a few people still coming, but let's just start with a prayer. But has anyone got any special prayer requests that they want to, uh, they want to make before we start? A new iPhone. A new iPhone? Yeah. I think not. No special prayer request? Yeah. I have to try and to withstand to return. So You have what? I have to try to return and to withstand. Okay. We can pray for that. Sure. Uh, Sil Sil Silvano, you mean? Okay. Silvano going to Italy. Well I might be going to Italy as well to baptize some um, migrants. <coughs> some of the African migrants. So pray for that as well. Right, okay then, let's, let's pray, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus to thank you that you are real and that your Son is real and that we didn't believe in vain. We thank you so much for your presence and for your desire to save. And we pray, Father, from the bottom of our hearts that you will guide each of us here to believe in your Son, to believe more firmly in your word, and to really feel the extent of your love and your grace towards us. And to be kept by you in that way that leads to life eternal. While we're waiting, Father, for the Lord Jesus to return, we pray that you'll bless each of us in all the issues that we've got in our lives. That we might believe that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Please be with us in our specific issues. Be with all of us in our battles against temptation and our desire to live a true and a holy life before you and be with uh, Silvano in her trip to Italy and be with the people who are thinking to get baptised in Italy as well that I'm in contact with and please bring us all, Father, to the life eternal for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, so I wanted to start off, you know, last week we looked at Luke chapter 15 and we looked at the parable of the lost coin how this woman had 10 coins, that was all that she had, that was hers. She didn't own her own body, it was just her 10 coins that she had as her very own. And she lost, she lost one of them. This was a huge personal loss, and she searched for it until she found it. And the coin couldn't do anything, it couldn't grow legs and walk. The initiative was totally with, with the woman, it was like, Jesus looking. And then there's a parable of the lost sheep. The man has a hundred sheep, one goes missing. He, as the good shepherd, is clearly Jesus, searches for the lost sheep until he finds it. And I said that when a sheep gets lost, it freezes. Just panic. It freezes in panic. And so this is really the picture of us, that in a sense we are unable to repent because we're just stuck and we're so weak. But Jesus then takes the initiative and comes into our lives. But then he tells the parable of the prodigal son that goes straight on from this. So I was gonna read it off the screen, but the screen shot. So um, I'm sure you all sort of know the story, that the, uh, the story of the prodigal. Who's got a loud voice who could read this out? I've got a loud voice, Pastor. <laughs> a certain man has had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the inheritance of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered into money all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his inheritance in reckless living. And when he had spent it all, there arose a mighty famine in that country, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. 
and he would and he would gladly have filled his belly with the husks that pigs, that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hard servants have bread enough to spare, but I perish here with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and went to his father. But while he was yet far away, his father saw him and was moved with compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf, kill it and let us eat and make merry. For this my son who was dead is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. <laughs> now his eldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and inquired what, those, what these things might mean. And he said to him, Your brother came, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. But he was angry and would not go in, and his father came out and encouraged him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have served you, and I have never transgressed a, command, a commandment of yours, and yet, you, ne and yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But when this, when this your son came, who has devoured your living with prostitutes, you killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, you are ever with me, and that is mine, and all that is mine is yours. But it was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Thank you very much. So, this is now giving a bit of another dimension, isn't it, on the whole thing, that the, the lost coin and the lost sheep couldn't really do anything. The good shepherd found them. But with this prodigal son, well, he does do something. He sort of wants to come back. So there's sort of two aspects to it, aren't there? But there must be some move on our side, no matter how small. And that's why we're all here. I don't believe any of us are here for free, free grub. There's a movement on our side, no matter how small. And God is going to come and develop that. So, this man had two sons, so he didn't have a big family. And at the end of it, he says to the older son, look son, all that I've got left is yours. Right? I've given half to your younger brother who blew it, but the bit that's left is all yours. So he's got no sons apart from these two. So in those days, if you were wealthy, you had lots of wives, lots of kids. I would take this guy to be lower middle class. He's not totally homeless. He owns something. He's only got two sons. And they're both no good. Now, this loving father is, of course, God. Well, the younger says to him, Father, give me the inheritance of property that's coming to me. Give it to me right now. And he divides his property. I said last week that in all these parables, there is something that is unreal. There is an element of unreality in these parables. So, the son is saying to his father, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead. Give it to me now and give it all to me now. I wish you were dead. I want it now. Which is not a very good attitude because I would have said to him, uh, excuse me, you get the inheritance when I'm dead. You don't get it now. And he's like, oh, but I, you know, I want it now. Uh, as if you're dead. Jesus was a Jew and he's talking in a Jewish context. And under the law of Moses, it said that the firstborn son had to have a double inheritance. You did not split what you had between your two kids. The firstborn got more. But the father divides the property into two. 
and splits it between the two of them. <coughs> so the father is like being extremely kind to the boy. And did the father guess what was going to happen? Probably so, because the guy had probably shown the sort of person he was. And you think, well, why does the father do this? As I say, to Middle Eastern ears, or even to our ears, thinking about the story, something is not right here, something is unreal. And it's that element of unreality that is the point. And I think the element here is that God will give you, actually, what you really, really want. Even if he knows it may not be the best thing for you. Because he so respects your free will, you may say, oh, but I want to be a multi-millionaire. I want to have, uh, I want to have a BMW and, and two Mercedes. I really like that, why don't I get it? The answer is because you don't really want it. Yeah, on a surface level, you may say, yeah, I'm not against it. But in the end, you get what you really want. That's how it is. You get what you really want, and God will give you what you really want. And if your heart's desire is to be saved and to serve God, He'll give you that. If that's what you really want, you will get it. So then, <clears throat> the father comes over as extremely, uh, almost too loving. And if we had the screen working, we'd have played Amazing Grace. Because it is an amazing grace, and it is an unusual grace. We have been given so much. Now, not many days later, the younger son gathered into money all that he had and took a journey into a far country and squandered the inheritance in reckless living. If you sell something like property quickly, you don't get a good price for it. Yeah, I want to sell my car, I want to sell it now. Okay, you get a small price. You, you want to sell property and it's got to be sold today? Well, you're not going to get much for it. And we all know that and it's always been the same. He <laughs> disgraced the father because an inheritance was from the Lord. And everyone would have thought, oh, that, that land has been in that family for generations and the young guy just sold it quickly for a very small price, got the cash and went off into a far country, which in for Jews you can take he went into the Gentile world and squandered this money in reckless living. The straight away, we don't like this guy. The way the story is being painted, we don't like this guy. He's, that's not what a decent, normal person does, right? We don't like the guy. We don't like the guy. But unfortunately, we're going to see that we have no choice. We are him. Because at the end of the story, the older brother remains outside the family. You know, the boy blows the money, comes back, father, oh yeah, come back in the family, welcomes him back, and the older brother says, I'm not going into the I'm not going into the party. And the the scene closes with the older brother outside. And so the father has lost his older son by the end of the story, but he's regained his younger son. So you've got a choice. Which son are you? Are you the one who messes up but comes back? Or are you the one who's self-righteous and all the rest of it and ends up outside the father's family? Jesus told a similar parable when he said, Again, a man had two sons. And he said to them, Go and work in my vineyard. And one of them says, I will not go. And he's rude to his dad. And then afterwards, he repents and goes. He does do it. The other son says, Yes, I'll go, sir. I'll go, Dad. I'll work in your vineyard. No, he doesn't do it. And so again, you, you, you're forced into a choice. Are you the one who refuses but then comes? Or are you the one who just uses nice words but actually your heart's not in it? It's not a very nice choice. But the Lord has put us in that position, hasn't he? Where we, we have the choice. Which, which of these two boys are I? And of course, we, it's our choice, because you, you want to be the one who ends up with God forever. But that means that I'm afraid you have to recognize that you have gone wrong. And who wants to do that? No one wants to do this. These days, to talk about conviction of sin, and to realize that you are a sinner and so forth, 
Nobody wants to do that. That's old time. Uh, you're awesome. How are you? Oh, I'm awesome. Everybody's awesome. Everything's awesome. It's just them or her or, you know, society and something that's wrong. I'm awesome, you know? And don't tell me I'm not. This is where true Christianity hits hard. That we do have to accept that we, we are not, I'm afraid, as we would like to think that we are. And it's only when you get there that you find that grace is amazing. You can't see amazing grace if actually you think, I did nothing wrong. I'm a good guy. It's all the rest of it. You, got, you will have no fire in you. You will have no passion for other people unless you have yourself been convicted that, look here, I'm not, I'm not the greatest. And yeah, I have not been as I should have been. So, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that country and he began to be in want. Jesus was building his parables on bits and pieces out of the Old Testament. And whenever there's a famine in the Old Testament, it brings people to God. For example, the time of Elijah, there was a famine and then the people turned back to God, stopped worshipping Baal. Ruth and Naomi, when there's a famine in Moab, they come back to the God of Israel and go and live in Israel. Okay. So, the famine arose and this brought them, brought the younger son to think about dad, basically, and think about how things were back home. Translating that into Croydon in the 21st century, we know there's a crisis with the cost of living. And you go and do your supermarket shop or whatever, in Aldi or wherever you go, and you, well in my case, little girl, mummy, buy me these chockies that you normally buy me. Everything's so expensive, put it back on the shelf. You may say, well oh, that's not a famine. No, it's not a famine. People aren't dying on the streets of starvation, right? But there is a problem in putting basic food on the table. And so, what does that do? It does make people think about God. And this is the wonderful thing of understanding that all things are in God's hand. And that we are being used, uh, not used, but that we are being uh, sort of crafted and moulded by God through a bad experience. Since it was started in Ukraine, all sorts of people writing to me, I want a Bible, I want to turn to God. And this is how amazing it is to understand that good and evil, or disaster if you like, all comes from God. It, there is no sort of radical evil as in, you know, out of control or oh, whoops, God can't handle that. No, he is using these things. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He joined himself, it means he glued himself to some wealthy guy from that country. Now, I guess most of us are not from the Middle East. I'm also not from the Middle East. But if you've been out to Middle Eastern countries, you will have noticed that there is this thing about begging, right? And a beggar will glue himself to somebody. It was many years ago, I was in Syria, before all this business started in Syria, and I watched from the, uh, just the uh, terrace of the hotel that I was at. There were some Western guys walking down the street. I don't know who they were. They could have been Aussies, they could have been Brits, they could have been Americans, I don't know. Walking down the street. And this beggar glued himself to them. And they were being rude to him, they were swearing at him, they were shouting at him. He, he kept on to them, kept on. Kept on following. Until eventually they threw him something. Then an Arab guy drew up in a big, uh, I don't know, Mercedes or something, oh, and the guy goes for him. And the guy just turned to him and said something, and the guy just bowed his head and walked away. And I spoke to some of the Arab folks and I told them what I'd observed, and they said, oh yeah, yeah, that's how we deal with beggars. I said, yeah, well, what's the magic word? What did you say to him? And made the guy <laughs> bow his head and walk away. They, they said to me, well, <clears throat> our society is based around shame. And you ask a beggar to do something that he's not going to do. You may say to him, oh, you want a coin from me? Uh, lick my dirty uh, boots with, with your tongue and I'll give you some money. Or you, you ask him to do something that 
he's not going to do. And then in shame, he walks away from you and you're free. These British or whoever they were, Aussies or whatever, shouting, cussing at this guy. No, no, he, he kept on with them. Give me some money. Arab guy told him to do something that was beneath anybody to do, unless you're really desperate. And that's what you have alluded to here, that he joins himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Now don't forget it's in a Jewish context. For Jews, pigs are unclean, right? So he says to the guy, uh, to the prodigal son, uh, you want some money out of me? Uh, yeah, go and feed, you're a Jew, right? Go and feed my pigs. <laughs> and he does it. For a Jew to be told by a Gentile, go feed pigs. No, you'd have to be starving, literally on your last, last breath to, to do that. And a guy agrees. Because he has hit bottom. He's hit bottom. And this is the idea that when you hit bottom, then you come back to God. And the problem, I think, for us here, Croydon, 21st century, is that you may hit the false bottom. You may just get pretty low, but somehow there's a safety net. You know, in countries like Sweden and Finland, if you're an alcoholic and you've got nothing, oh, you get diagnosed as having an illness called alcoholism, and the, the government will basically sponsor you <laughs> for your alcoholism. Um, you know, the, it's good that there's safety nets, but the problem is it stops people hitting bottom. We don't wish bottom on it, on it you know, anyone. But the, the message here is clear that it's only when you hit bottom that you turn really turn to, to your God. And who wants to hit bottom? Well, it's not that we want to be clever to avoid hitting absolute bottom, but you can avoid it if you are wise. And what is wisdom? Wisdom in this context is to recognize that yes, I have sinned and I desperately do need God in my life and yes I have not done the right thing please help me back that's the point that is the point and then you don't have to be bashed and beaten down to rock bottom where you totally like the Jew who is told to go into the field uh, and feed Gentile pigs so he would gladly have filled his belly with the husks that the pigs ate but no one gave him anything talk about no money no friend but when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, but I perish here with hunger? When he came to his senses, when he woke up, he said, Well, there's people back home who've got enough to eat, and I've got nothing. I'm eating what do pigs eat. When he came to his senses, in other words, you become uh, aware of reality you come to your senses only when you turn to God all these people walking around here with all their money and their jobs and their pension plans and all that stuff if they don't have God in their life they're, they're walking through a dream this is well, not the curse of mankind and amnesia this is mankind not aware that's why the Lord Jesus says that man is in darkness stumbling and doesn't know where he's going, because he does not see the light of this world. And so that is exactly how it is. You are insensible. You don't have any senses whilst you are just living the standard life of this world. You are simply stumbling in the darkness. But he came to his senses. He woke up. He saw life, real life, as it really is. And so... He says to himself, I will rise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. So he works out what he's going to say. Actually, when he gets to his father, he doesn't say anything of the sort. Because the father cuts short. Oh, you're back. That's enough. So... He thinks, well, I, I'm going to resign being a son of my father. I can't possibly. 
I just hope that Dad will take me as, as, as a slave, as a hired servant. <clears throat> but it was exactly because he's the son of his father that the father does have compassion. And he says, make me as one of your hired servants. And the idea is that he was still earning money. And I think the hint might be that he thinks, if I work long enough, I might be able to pay it back. And of course, when he does get home, oh, it's arms around the neck, oh yeah, please come, uh, etc. Yeah, you're the best, don't worry about anything, etc. So then, any idea that I am going to somehow pay back God, that I am somehow going to pay back in my own strength, this, this isn't a goer, this is not going to work. It's simply a case of wanting to go back and begin that journey back. So, he arose and went to his father. But while he was yet far, far away, his father saw him and was moved with compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. So, while he was far away, he, we are told, went to a far country. So the father somehow sees him in that far country and as soon as there is a movement back towards him, the father runs to him. In their Middle Eastern way, um, for an older man to run publicly was shameful, absolutely shameful, to run publicly when you're an old man. This is not okay. It's not decent person does. And why does he run to meet the sun before the sun comes into the village? Well, there is, I believe, in Arabic and certainly in the, in the Hebrew uh, concept, this idea of Ketsaza. And what that means is that if someone goes out of the village, <coughs> someone goes out of the village and displaces the family and messes up in, in a foreign land and then he comes back then he will be shamed, spat at and beaten by the people of the village and the father knows that's what's going to happen if my son comes who grabbed half my, well I gave him half my property he sold it off cheap, went and blew the money if he comes back Oh no, all the village kids are going to spit at him, hit him, shame him. I want to save him from that shame. And that, I think, is why he runs out and meets him. And decide, I'm no more worthy to be called your son. He doesn't get to the bit about, make me as one of your hired servants. No, 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 no. The father doesn't do that. Now, if this is how God forgives us, this is how we are to forgive others. And there is a strong idea that you can only forgive somebody if they are specifically repentant. And if there is an agreed version of what went on between us, then if you are sorry, I shall forgive you. Well, you can run your life like that, but the difficulty is that as the New Testament teaches, as we say in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. So then, the policy, if you like, that you have about forgiving people will be the policy that God has on you. And if you're saying, I shall forgive you if you agree with me about the version of events that happened, and if you're sorry and you get on the floor before me, I shall forgive you. If you don't do that, I'm not forgiving you. Well, if that's your position, all right, fair enough, but that's how God's going to treat you. And David says that we have many secret sins. That is sins that we don't even know that are sins, that we are not repentant of. And yet we trust God's going to scribble the whole plate, uh, slate clean. Now, trust and relationship going forward are different things uh, to forgiveness. You can forgive somebody who is not penitent. 
That does not mean you trust them, doesn't mean you work with them, doesn't mean you live together, doesn't mean going forward you have any relationship. Okay, that's the all different things. But forgiveness, I suggest to you, is separate to that. And that we should really, we must actually forgive whether or not someone is repentant or not. Especially in this case, you see here how the, the father doesn't want to hear all this story. Really, you have made the move back. I saw you in the far country and I have run to you to meet you. And as the old Yiddish saying says, going out to meet him, I met him running toward me. And this is what Jesus is alluding to. That you make one move toward God and he is running towards you. You make one little move and he will rush towards you. Absolutely rush towards you. So, God also seeks to shield from shame. This is totally different to how human, uh, human operation is. That you did wrong, so you must be shamed. And then, oh, well, maybe we, we, we get back to normal. God runs out, the Father runs out to meet the Son and to escort him back so that there is not this kazatza, there is not this um, shame on the boy by the village and brings him back home. And the father says to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. In other words, restore him to being my son. The guy has said, uh, I don't want to, I'm not worthy to be your son, I just want to be a servant, a hired servant. No, no, no. You're my son and I want to prove this. Even without hearing the guy's repentance. And so what is repentance? Well, repentance is a rethinking. Now, I'm not saying you can live as you want, etc. Not at all. But it doesn't matter. But what I'm saying is that the quality of our repentance is never 100%. It, it isn't. But it is that movement to God. And that is what we are, all of us here, that's why we're here in this pub. Because we've all made that move. And God is, is rushing towards us, if we will get it. And he says, for this my son who was dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, that's what happens when you're baptized. When you go into the water, that is like death with Jesus. You come out of the water, that is like being alive with him. And so the father says, my son is, is dead and is alive again. Well, there is a wonderful little um, verse which says that in, in the Old Testament, that says, whoever loves wisdom rejoices his father, but he that keeps company with harlots or prostitutes spends his substance and is just left there. But if you if you spend your father's substance on harlots, shame on you. Jesus knew that verse, but he's saying, well, it's not just don't just leave it there. Don't think as like the Old Testament got you to that well you've sinned, you're convicted of your sin, etc. And tough. No, he is actually he is actually saying, yeah, but I can take you further. So, the older son is in the field, he hears the music and dancing, he says, what does this mean? And they said, well, your brother's come and your father's killed the fatted calf. And he was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and encouraged him. And he says to his father, for so many years I served you, I, I never broke a commandment of yours. Never. Which is probably untrue. But when this your son came, who has devoured your living with prostitutes, you killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, you are ever with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Well, this whole process of dying to sin and living again, which is what we do when we're baptised, this actually goes on all the way through our lives. I gave an example last week 
of let's imagine a woman in some small flat in some small flat in, in uh, here in Croydon and she's smoking a cigarette out the window and she's thinking back to the abortion that she had let's say 10 years ago and she's thinking you know am I too far gone but there's that little bit of movement there towards God oh yeah God is rushing towards you and she who was dead is alive again there on that balcony in a flat in Croydon or a bloke standing at a bus stop thinking about how yeah years ago I sold drugs to those kids and I messed their lives up probably can God forgive me yeah that turning back to God that being dead and coming alive again that lost and being found this is actually what goes on in our lives all the time all the time it happens when you're baptized yes you physically as it were go into the water you die and you come alive again and if anyone wants to be baptized talk to me about it we baptized only last week i'm very happy to help you do it but what i'm saying is that that principle goes on all the way through our lives every time you turn back now the whole context of this chapter in Luke 15 is that Jesus is eating with sinners and they say to him why are you eating with sinners and he says this is why he gives these uh, parables and this story ends with them having a feast they're having a feast and so he's saying to them this is why I eat with sinners this is a celebration of repentance and what we do when we break bread we look forward to the time when Jesus will return and we will again take bread and wine with him in his kingdom but also you know it's got different meanings I mean sometimes when you break bread you just think about the sufferings of Jesus other times you're thinking, yeah, one day we will do this again with him when he comes back. Or in this context, it is a celebration of our repentance. We celebrate that we have been accepted back. And we sit here as forgiven people. And you ask yourself, how did the younger son feel when this feast was going on? This is a celebrating you coming back. And the guy would have been like awkward. Uh, no, 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 I, I don't I don't want to be here. Um, okay, Dad, if you, if you have to do the feast, okay. Um, but I feel a bit awkward. Um, yeah, I just thank you so much. And he would have sat there at the feast like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I've got enough to eat. I've got my relationship with my dad back. I've got absolutely everything now. And this is how we feel. We're going to do this. We're going to take the bread and wine. We're going to have um, the feast. I wonder, Cindy, could you, uh, could you pour out the, the wine? Oh, here we go. Okay. And this is our feeling. And who am I? Who on earth am I? That I should be here. But this is the spirit of it, of it all. That, yeah. It's too wonderful, in a way, to understand. It's just too wonderful, in one sense, that he should have found me. And we all struggle with this sense of um, meaninglessness. Who am I? Well, what meaning do I have? What, what reason am I here? Is this for real? Why would God pay so much attention to me, some obscure little person? But this is the point. This is what is amazing about grace, that he does have this special interest in me. And we struggle to get the reality of it because we have never encountered this in any of our human relationships. In all our human relationships, the, the forgiveness has very often been, shall I say, political, that, yeah, well, we're going to go and live in together because <clears throat> it's too difficult not to. So, yeah, we will <clears throat> just move on from this. You know, let's just not talk about this anymore. Whereas God's forgiveness is of a totally different nature. Absolutely different nature. 
that I actually deal with it, God is saying, and you are actually with me. And again, we have the choice that we finish with. You know, how does the story finish? All these parables come to an end, and we are left thinking, I wonder how the story finished. And that's the art of Jesus in creating these parables. You know, how did the story finish? Well, the old man died, I guess, at some point. What, what happened? Did the boy uh, mess up again? Did the older brother come back? Did the two brothers make up with each other? We don't know. But we're left to think about that. And of course, the question then, we realise, points to yourself. But didn't Abel, though, um, came, go to the field? And killed Abel. That's right. Uh, that, that's that's a, another so two bad brothers. Yeah. That's right. Another two bad brothers. But the question is, how will my story finish? You know, that's the point. Right. I'd like to read to us, um, or, well, remind us about the breaking of bread. That the bread represents the body of Jesus and the wine represents the blood of Jesus. Okay? So we're going to give thanks for the bread and wine. And by taking this we are saying, I want identity. I want identity with Jesus. I want this. I say yes to this. It's our little movement towards him. And God is rushing towards you in response. So let's just give thanks for that bread and wine. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread in which we see the symbol of the body of Jesus. And we thank you for the cup of wine in which we see the symbol of his blood. And we struggle to believe that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And we pray that we might each humbly grasp it with both hands and really believe this and know that we are special to you and that we are now back safe with you. Just pray that we might abide with you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Right, just pass it round. Pass the bread round. Uh, uh, yeah. Mark, could, could you hand out the wine? One, one to each person, please. Uh -huh.